and I am a curator. And I have spent the last 30 years of my life working in the arts. Now, I love the arts, but I'm not a great artist. So what did I do? I got involved in making art happen for other people, right? So you can have an, a field, you can work in the arts without being an artist. And that's just, you know, a tidbit for you all when you're thinking about that. Now, I don't know. I can't see your hands, but how many of you go to museums or like museums? Anybody? A few. Awesome. I grew up in museums and I love them. And as an adult, I work hard to make museums places that are relevant, places that tell stories. And as a curator, I feel like I am a visual storyteller. I want to tell you a story about this piece that is behind me. Oh, I, I know you want to know a little bit of, about a career path. You know, my degree is actually in marketing because I wanted to grow up and have a job. And then I worked in the field of marketing. And guess what? I started marketing museums. Then I started working with schools. I ended up being director of education at a very large art and um, art facility. I have run public art programs. I have everything from theater, dance, uh, to the visual arts. So there are, are actually degrees in museum studies, which is a great way to start off if you like museums and you want to take some time and um, learn about the visual arts. And it, everything from modern art to historical art to paintings. Is, and I think that that is the beauty that I love about the visual arts is that, well, my favorite thing about the arts, you guys, there's no wrong answers in art. None, absolutely none. Whatever you create is your creation, and it is perfect, just like it is. So I think, you know, one of my personal beliefs and loves is that there are no wrong answers in art. Now, some people might disagree with me, but you tell them I told you otherwise. I don't know if any of you know, and I, this exhibit is very special to me because I specify in community legacy history. So being an African-American woman in a field where there aren't a lot of African-Americans and especially not in curating and especially not for just museums in general. So this museum is not a black art museum, but it's Black History Month and they are dedicated to being connected to their community and this exhibit is one way that we do this so i've been doing this all over southern california and i actually live in san diego county so you know we have cars and now we have skypes like i'm in your classroom which i am very excited about i do want to say something about this piece of art behind me um, do any of you teachers remember a show called Good Times or an artist named Marvin Gaye? There was a very famous uh, piece of art called Sugar Shack by a very famous artist named Ernie Barnes. And this piece here is by the same artist, but it is about the barbershop. Ernie Barnes was a foot player he got a football scholarship he always wanted to be an artist but he went to uh, Durham North Carolina to be a football player and then studied art and then when he retired became a full-time artist this piece he created is an original piece about a barber shop today's exhibit uh, that I'm taking a journey through is about the afro do I have any afros in the audience I can't see you guys you know yes so we're, this is called From the Afro to the Crown Act. This piece was done in the 50s by Ernie Barnes. He is no longer living. And this is his piece. He gave it to Dr. Morrow, whose collection we're seeing, as a gift because when he was a San Diego Charger, Dr. Morrow was his barber and did his hair. It's a very... Uh, Figurative, it's very live. This piece has a lot of action. 
I mean, there is some hair being cut, but the barbershop in the African-American community is a place where people visit. It's a place where you learn things. You told stories. You got the news of the day. It was like the community center for largely for men, um, but we do see a woman back here who looks like her son is under a lamp getting his uh, hair done. So the barbershop is, is a hub for the community and um, the journey of African Americans to the barbershop and the journey through hair as it could be an industry has a lot of great stories behind it. So I would like to move you into our exhibit, which is in the Schilling Gallery. This is a portrait of me at age 14 with my afro, of course. Somebody wants to know what year it is, I can tell. 1971. So Willie Morrow, who is now 80, was a barber and an inventor and Sometimes we even say a little bit of a mad scientist. And he really, really grabbed on to the idea of the texture of African, of black people's hair, the very texture of hair. And he wrote a book called 400 Years Without a Comb. And he really realized that when African arrived here, when black people arrived here, we didn't bring our combs. We didn't bring much of anything. So this collection of artwork was created to tell the story 400 years without a comb. So you will see some actual artwork by this renowned artist, Albert Fennell, and um, some artifacts, actual combs that he started collecting from Africa. I've been working with Dr. Morrow for five years and, you know, help him take care of an exhibition because when you have all these artifacts and actual pieces of artwork, you have to take care of them. They need to be stored correctly. Um, we need to watch out of them. They, they have value. Some of them, I would say the things you're seeing are valued anywhere from a thousand to, jeez, $500,000. So it's very important to take care of a collection like this. So I'm going to bring you in to see some combs. So Dr. Morrow started collecting combs. He went to Africa and he started collecting combs. And he realized that we don't, there wasn't really the right kind of comb here for us, our black people with our kinky curly hair. So these are beautiful hand carved combs. Combs are made of teak and uh, balsa woods, and they often tell the story of a tribe. So this comb has a turtle on it, so it's a symbolic method of talking about a tribe. I'm going to move you through to the talking a little bit about the natural. So when we came here, we had our hair. We couldn't figure out what to do with our hair. We went from from forks to cake cutters, and uh, the Afro natural as a hairstyle really kind of came into the black power movement back in the 70s when we were just saying, we're going to be natural, we're going to wear our hair. It became a symbol of, of pride. And Dr. Morrow, who had a barbershop, started working really hard on creating a comb. So he took a washing machine motor and started thinking, I need these long, these long things. I'm going to make these long wood pieces. And so he slowly carved in all these little wood pieces because it's stick by stick. He made one stick, he made another, and then he would glue them together to make a prototype. You know what a prototype is? A sample of a comb. This was one of the first prototypes where this is actually made of separate sticks, all glued together. And here are a couple other prototypes where you see started gluing together and saying, okay, this can be a comb. 
Then he had to figure out how to manufacture them. And the Afro and the Afro pit comb was kind of born. Before we had the comb, some people would use like not just forks, but they were called cake cutters. And you could put it in your hair and you could just, you know, fluff your hair all up. But uh, he developed a whole lot of combs. And I'm going to bring you over to this wall of combs that he developed. Some of them are still in existence today. This is collage. I don't know if you can see his logo, but he, um, he actually created all of these combs. This was actually an original cake cutter. And I don't know if you can see it, but it was really pointy. So it was not the best thing to do. You could actually um, hurt yourself. Um, or if you stuck in your back pocket, something else could happen. The most popular comb was this one because it closes up in your pocket and keeps your hair out. Uh, people have been visiting the exhibit and talking about these. Your parents, when you go home today, talk to them about the comb. Ask them their hair story because um, they will have one. It's been fun in the museum to watch people come in and start showing us pictures and telling us their hair story. So this, I know it sounds funny, why are we talking so much about hair as an art form? But because it's a topic that makes people think a little more and learn some history through looking at art and the story of Dr. Morrow. So um, again, this is another art piece by Jean Cornwell Wheat. This is a um, pen and ink drawing of a young man getting his afro taken care of by the barber with a pit comb. So as time went on, Willie Morrow became kind of the wizard of hair care. So he became known as a wizard of hair care. And in about 1973, African Americans were in the military and the military said, hey, we have a, we're going to make a little easier. We're going to let everyone have three inches of hair. Well, this was fine for their Anglo and Euro-American counterparts, but if you have three inches of hair and you're an African American, you might have too much hair to fit under your military, uh, your, your helmet. And so then it became an issue of discrimination, which is a theme uh, for black people in America. And so they said, well, we have to do something. And lo and behold, Willie Marl and his said, well, no one knows how to work on black hair. You have all these people enlisted and all your barbers know how to cut the hair of all the other um, ethnicities, but not the African Americans. And we say that he flew a million miles in the sky teaching people how to cut hair. This is a very old photo of Willie Morrow, when he went everywhere, he was hired by the military and actually created a barber curriculum to train people how to cut hair. And they actually made a military afro. This is this picture. A military afro was exactly three inches tall, but then tapered in on the sides. And if you see this, this is the standard uh, military afro that was then um, identified as hair. So I have some very old ebony magazines because that's pretty interesting to see. And then as you will or, you know, at some point you're going to learn about some famous Californian African Americans because in California we had a movement going on with people like Angela Davis, and uh, the Black Panther Party, and Huey. And I was born and raised in Berkeley, so I remember these guys walking around uh, with their afros. I'm sure that's why I had mine. But, you know, just for the record, the Black Panther Party were named as revolutionists, but they really started out, they were a bunch of Cal Berkeley law students, and they would stop people on the corner and read them their rights and tell them, oh, you know, you have some rights here. And they would do things like feed breakfast, kids breakfast, who didn't have food in Oakland. And so there are a lot of stories that you will hear. And then it becomes incumbent 
upon us. It, it becomes necessary for us to start telling our own stories and to do the history and the work behind it. And so, you know, as a curator, I do, I'm kind of a history geek. Like I will look up things and find out what's the real story and see if it makes sense and see how I want to share it. And I think that um, for this exhibit, that's what we did. We started way back 400 years and we had to move into uh, the Black Panther movement. And along the way, we use art and artists to help us tell the story. Because it just, you learn a little differently. There is a local artist here in Pomona. His name is Gary Lett and he was referred to me and reached out and said, I've got this, I've got this little lovely piece and you might want to include her. And I love her, look at her Afro. She is, um, she's learning, she's thinking. So I decided that maybe in my mind, and this is what, when you're a curator, you can, you know, I have an idea of what I want you to think. It doesn't always happen. You might come in and not think this, but in my mind, she's learning about the Afro. So she's surrounded by combs. She's learning about her history. She's wearing her proud natural hair. And uh, so that's, you know, my little story within a story using art and artists and art to um, make a difference. Now we also, um, built a barbershop. So Willie Morrow had a barbershop. I'm going to just get you over to this picture. For years on Market Street in, in San Diego. And this was the picture of his barbershop, the actual shop, with his big comb in front and, uh, you know, his curly hair products. He went on to do a million things, but we're focusing on the Afro today. So this was his, his barber shop. And we're going to um, kind of pan around and give you a little view into uh, what the barber shop looked like. And again, barber shops are community centers. It's where, you know, coming of age happens. It's where you grow up and you learn about uh, life or you solve political problems. Oh, my goodness. I think every politician started off in a barber shop. So this was Willie Morrow's first barber chair. So that's how you say, when we talk about artifacts, these are amazing antique things that tell a part of his story. The picture behind the barber chair is his actual shop, which doesn't, is not around anymore, right? And then he had a lot of Afro hairstyles, hairstyles for, for men and hairstyles for women. And so we thought you just kind of a little bit of a sneak, like, oh, what would it have felt like if I was in the 70s? Which Afro would I pick? I'm in the dome. <laughs> Which Afro would I pick? And I don't know if you can show some of the hairstyles by tomorrow. One of the women in the hairstyles by Morrow is a friend of mine who just had her 70th birthday. <laughs> And she was a 16-year-old then. So those are the women. Some of you might have a hairstyle like this now. Or you might look at this and, and next time you see your barber say, hey, can I, can I have the, the part in my afro? Uh, can you combine it with some braids? So recently, as in two months ago, in the state of California, the Crown Act was passed. And the Crown, because if, can you believe that we are still fighting the battle of how to wear our hair? People have been discriminated against. People have been told they can't work. People have not received job uh, promotions. And so there's actually now a law put in place by Holly and it's a law that says you can wear your hair how you want to in the workplace. So now you cannot be discriminated against. You cannot be turned down for a promotion or even not hired. Right now, this in 2020, which is why 
we created this exhibit, the historical view from the Afro way back then to the Crown Act today. Now, we have a little hashtag going on, you guys, and it's called Curl Stories. So we're asking women to give us their curl stories, men too, and we're having because um, then, and so we just sort of starting to publish them. But if you guys are hashtaggers and you have a curl story, get on and tell us about it. Now, my partner in this exhibit was uh, Cheryl Morrow, who is the daughter of Willie Morrow, who is now carrying on the natural hair tradition and with new products and new teachings and new ways for us to celebrate our curly, kinky, wild, and crazy hair just the way that we want to. So I think I'm ready to open up to questions, um, but this is my hair story. What would happen when someone comes of age, came of age? When which are the 400 years? Are you thinking of in Africa or? In Africa. In Africa. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought. <laughs> um, because even now there are rites of passages that happen for young people. And there was a, such of a thing called a rites of passage. And every tribe, I think, had a lot of different things that would happen for a young man, but sometimes it was you were able to hunt, you were able to be part, or you maybe you would be able to be part of the spiritual teachings, uh, but you would definitely kind of move out of being part of the family group into being part of uh, the work of the men and the work of the tribe. Um, but it would also depend on your gift because in Africa, people would look at your gift when you were born and watch you and figure out where to put you. But we would call it a rites of passage. How important is the story or emotional connection to all art pieces? Well, I think that becomes uh, a little bit of a thought for the viewer. For me, I've spent quite a bit of time trying to tie in the art pieces that are actually art to the photography and the artifacts that are actually historical so that you kind of get, I hope, a balanced little journey into this, into this subject matter. So I feel like it's important. Did the viewer find it important? Please do let us know. Uh, so the next question is, how long have you had the, the exhibits for? This exhibit has been um, opened up on um, January 30th, and it's here till March 1st. So it's a, this is about a third of the total of Willie Morrow's collection. So I have done the 400-year exhibit, which would take about five rooms this size. So I actually put this uh, exhibition together for this moment in time. I want to know about William Morrow a little bit more. <laughs> so, uh, Willie Morrow was um, born in um, Alabama. He is now 80 years old. He uh, was a barber. He cut his first head of hair at the age of 14. Uh, he went on to cut hair professionally and in that process realized that um, you know, from the comb, he actually created California Curl, which was a softer form of what was then a curl-activated process. He has collected curling irons. He has hair products from Matt a. C. Madam C.J. Walker. He is, even now, he's creating a bunch of green hair care products. I went to visit him. He's 80. He was in his lab coat cooking up things, and I said... <laughs> Really? <laughs> Maybe you should not be figuring that out. So he's, he's um, really been quite a success uh, with California Curl being his next, next step after the Afro. He actually also owned a radio station and uh, the San Diego Monitor newspaper. So he was a brilliant entrepreneur, uh, inventor, and uh, publisher. Arts that are made by graphic designers. Look at this. I am standing in front of Sister, you know we miss you. These are screen prints by local artist Duan Kelly. And 
He's a graphic designer. So these are uh, prints, and he's done them, as you see, with different backgrounds and different textures. And he is uh, here in Redlands. So yes, look at that. You saw that when you, when you saw me standing in front of them, didn't you? All right, Ms. Goodwin, I guess those were the only questions we had. Uh, so thank you so very much for volunteering your time and uh, showing us around the museum. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all the students for your participation. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.